Hey everyone, my name is Clint Sarion, The Smiling Ninja, and you're watching 222 Productions. Well, this is it, ladies and gentlemen. It's the final semi-final of the season, which means next week we are finally in Vegas for Midoriyama proper. So, let's talk about this final semi-final so we can, you know, get there already. I'm excited. Who cares about this episode? Honestly, it wasn't that good. <laughs> it w And it wasn't even, like, anyone's fault other than the editing. Editing made this really dull. Just gonna go out and say it. Also, I'm gonna get this out of the way just because, like, I don't want to give it any more det attention than it deserves. A&W uh, invited some no-name TikTokers to the show. Like, yeah, they have 10 million followers. It's like, who cares? It's amazing of how many followers you can have, how many millions of followers you can have, and still not be known by most people on the planet. Um, it didn't help the ratings, like, at all. And partially because they did such a poor job promoting it. But they made a big deal in the episode of them competing. And I imagine most of the people, considering the average age of the people watching A&W, is pretty old at this point, um, said, who? when they were introduced and they just brought him in for like an exhibition run and they even let him practice the course ahead of time at least the ward wall they did and so it wasn't worth it they sucked one failed the second obstacle one failed the first obstacle and um that's that's all i'm going to say at the end of the day if they could at least pick next time, if they're going to put invite TikTokers, at least invite TikTokers that have, make, like, interesting videos. I looked up their work, and, like, literally one of them has a video where it's just him putting on a hat. Because, you know, they're they're pretty boys, and that's where they get their popularity from. Because young women think they're, they're good looking. You know, back in the day, we called those boy banders. And at least those people had talent. <laughs> These days, you can get popular amongst young, uh, underage women by just existing which is kind of sad but now that i've gotten that off my chest let's talk about some real athletes who compete on this course shall we so uh this time around the course i don't know what happened this episode was interesting it, it was like what 12 clears <laughs> it was it was crazy uh let me let me give you let me give you some statistics so this is only ever since the semifinals uh, switched from a nine ep nine obstacle course to a ten obstacle course. This is only the fourth episode where uh, someone who made it to the ninth obstacle did not move on to the national finals, and for the first time ever, two people in the same episode who made it to the ninth obstacle did not move on to the national finals in Las Vegas. So that gives you an idea of how well, how good the, the results were uh, for this episode. And I'm trying to think, was it because the course was easier or was it because the field was so stacked with talented competitors? And honestly, I think it's a, it's a mix of both. It's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. I do honestly believe that this is, this course was overall the easiest course of the four semifinals. But also, you look at the list of people competing in this episode, it's like, holy cow, this might have been the most stacked of the four. So with those two together, it's like, yeah, I'm not surprised that we had such an abnormally high clear rate compared to the other three episodes. So this was the course. Uh, shrinking steps, lunatic ledges make their return for spot two. Followed by the return of Barrel Roll. I like Barrel Roll, but let's be honest, it's on the easier side uh, as far as A&W obstacles are concerned. And then Diamond Dash, the return of Drop Zone. So they tried. They, they obviously saw what happened in the previous semifinal. And instead, they had to um, uh, make some changes. They obviously added some padding to the handles. The, uh, the middle handle, there was one in the middle. And the first and third handle, there was like a, some padding higher up uh, near the cylinder that spins. And so when you grab it, it's you know, supposed to go padding. But like people were still getting their head hits. Like someone at the, uh, the, the rounded um, bottom of the one of the 
bars actually hit someone in the ear. Um, and I'm pretty sure that the, the drops were actually like slower. If it seems like that it, they weren't falling as quickly when they got to the actual drop portion of the drop zone, honestly, like just, just get rid of the obstacle. Don't bring it back next season. They should have, honestly, they should have replaced it this episode. I don't know what their production schedule was like, if they had enough time to change things around, but like, I would have just brought back wall to wall because this obstacle, it, you know, the modification that they made for this episode, it, it's basically, it's the definition of polishing a turd, you know, it's like, yeah, it's better, but it still sucks. So that's, that's all I got to say about drop zone. I've said plenty last time and you know, basically obstacle sucks. Don't bring it back. I will be cross though, if they actually have the audacity to <laughs> put it in Vegas. Uh, of course, six warped wall, seven salmon ladder, eight is the return of crazy clocks, which which is one of the other reasons besides barrel why I maintain this is one of the easier courses because crazy clocks of the uh, obstacles they put in spot eight, uh, these four episodes, it's clearly the easiest of the th- of the three. You know, course crew is challenging, and obviously uh, padlock was super challenging. Crazy clocks, it's on the easier side. Like yeah, people failed it, but. It has that sense of familiarity, you know, I, I've commented in the past that I don't think it's a stage three obstacle like they had back in A&W 11. Um, it's a good challenge, but it's not, it's not the easy, it's not the hardest obstacle in the world. Actually, I could, I would argue maybe they should have put crazy clocks in spot five <laughs> to replace uh, drop zone and then have spot eight be either corkscrew or um, padlock. That might've been the better choice. And number nine is still the dungeon diving board split decision combo. Uh, one thing that I didn't comment on last week about diving boards is that the middle board is higher up this time around than the first and third boards, which is probably a contribution to people failing the obstacle. And of course, number 10 was the spider trap. So once again, no real, no real intro, which was uh, surprising to me. But uh, we go straight into Devin Alexander, um, which like this obstacle, this, this, uh, I'm sorry, Devin, like (laughs) this was a bad video. This was just all about his mother, his mother, whose nickname is Pow or real name. I don't know. But like, they're telling us about how she has a gymnast background. And I'm just like, I'm sorry. Like, I know nothing about Devin. Can we talk about Devin? Not Pow, please? Did she compete in in the first round? I don't remember. I don't care to look it up in this case. But like, yeah, it was not great. <laughs> and um, also, one last thing about Drop Zone: Matt Eisman didn't mention that the competitors were calling it Headbanger. Um, I am surprised they left that in the show because that's n- more of a indictment on A and W. But um. Uh, Devin ended up failing the dungeon, but he does get to move on. He was one of the, uh, the handful of people who failed the ninth obstacle who still moved on. And then in fast forward, Sem Gray revealed that his new manager is Akbar, which obviously was a skit. It was pretty funny, but he failed Diamond Dash. Ah, Lindsay Exelson, who, I mean, they, they mentioned how, like, memorable her run was in Qualifier, and I'm going to be honest, I don't remember much about it. Uh, because it was so long ago. <laughs> There's so many runs, man, I can't expect to remember all of them. Uh, she unfortunately failed Battle Roll, didn't get a good launch. And Dan Polizzi failed the dungeon, and he was one of the two people who did not move on to the Vegas, despite reaching Obstacle 9, which was just devastating really so next up was nate hansen uh nate had one of those profile pieces that i really don't like where it's just a and w competitor meets one of his fans or her fans depending on the profile and basically it's like yeah he has you know growth hormone deficiency and like he met a kid with the same thing and it's like yeah okay it's great move on (laughs) i'm sorry you know I'm, i'm glad that the kid was able to, you know, get this big uh, motivation from from Nate, but it's like, it, it doesn't belong on the show. At least not at the length that it went to. 
Uh, Nate ended up clearing the course, the first clear, and like only the second featured run of the night. It's, it's a little suspicious at this point. Um, not a lot to say about his run other than that. It was really good, really solid. Nate, Nate has a tendency to be good. Um, for on the course, he's he's small but strong and compact. And they mentioned that he is, uh, you know, currently uh, the uh, smallest male to clear a semifinal course. Uh, shortest male, I should say, and the second shortest person ever, other than Casey Catanzaro, because they just can't help themselves. But to continue to mention Casey, who has been gone possibly longer than she's been in a and at this point. I don't know. In more fast forwards, Jamie Ross failed barrel roll, John Mack failed the crazy clucks, and Dan Wentworth uh, busted his crotch on barrel roll and then failed drop zone. Then Eric Middleton. Ooh, I like this one. Uh, the Bug Ninja making Matt and Akbar eat a new bug dish every time he cleared an obstacle past the warped wall. And much to Matt and Akbar's dismay, he ended up clearing the entire course. So they end up eat, uh, eating Nigerian rice with grasshopper, uh, wayworm um, dupe. Uh, I cannot read my handwriting. <laughs> Chocolate um, something. Uh, bee bread. Uh, he was he was perfect on the diamond boards where he cleared it. Just the way he did that was was perfect. Uh, so he ate some, they had to eat the cricket cookies, and then for clearing the whole course, they ate tarantula spider sushi. And uh, it was fun. I like this whole gimmick of making the announcers eat bugs because there's just some sort of pleasure I get of seeing Matt and Akbar, especially Akbar, uh, freak out from eating bugs. Brings me back to the old Fear Factor days. When I used to watch that show, the Joe Rogan Fear Factor, not the ludicrous Fear Factor, because... They went really light on the contestants when it came to eating stuff, at least in the episodes that I saw. We got our typical universal uh, promo. And uh, in more fast forward, San Folsom, uh, he hit his ear on drop zone and ended up failing crazy clocks. He's not moving on, unfortunately. Jamie Ron. They are obsessed with the Olympics. Why did they have Johnny Weir on the show on the show to support Jamie Ron? Does he know Jamie Ron? Doesn't appear to know Jamie Ron. Barely even appears to know the show that much, to be perfectly honest. And, you know, I respect Johnny Weir as as a as a commentator and as an athlete. But like the Olympics are over. They've been over for a while now. There's no way that ahead of time they thought that this episode was going to air before the Olympics. So, what's the excuse this time? I don't know. But he ended up failing the diving boards. First time he's ever failed a balance obstacle in like the 11 years he's competed on the show. And uh, I actually saw on Instagram he explained that he was trying to preserve a shoulder injury, which is why he didn't go for the dungeon. And then Tyler Yamauchi. Remember how I mentioned how Nate Hansen became the shortest male to clear a semifinal course? Well, Tyler Yamauchi ended up beating that by clearing the course and becoming the new shortest male <laughs> to clear a semifinal course. It's like they made such a big deal out of that when Nate did it. And then they just it fast forward someone who beats it right away. Unbelievable. The, I, the people who edit this show are unbelievable. They actually... It's amazing. We got 12 clears on this show, and they actually made it, they edited it to be more boring than... <laughs> uh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Next up was Heather Wessinger. She installs pacemakers, is a firefighter, and dating Dan Polizzi. Um... She had a big, big save on barrel roll, able to pull, uh, able to do, to do the one hand save, had a one hand save on drop zone, but then on the final drop of drop zone, she got flung off, rather comically I may add, and she ended up failing that obstacle. But she actually, I think she might be moving on. 
is she moving on? She is moving on, so she survives. Thank you, uh, woman's rule, is what Heather said. And then another fast forward, Brian Beckstrand, failed drop zone. And so they did um, a profile on his son, Kai Beckstrand, uh, who wants to be a firefighter, just like his dad, although awkwardly... Um, they, it, Kai's uh, profile piece said that both him and his dad will be moving on to Vegas, but after his performance on Drop Zone, that is obviously not happening, so kind of weird that they left that in already uh, after that. Just saying. Uh, they started him at Drop Zone, so it's like, well, he's not failing there. That'd be really awkward. Then they did this weird thing where they posed and did a, a, a photo at um, the Warped Wall with Matt and Akbar. And it's like, doesn't that eat up his time? Shouldn't he be like, you know, moving on? That's just me. Uh, but yeah, he ended up clearing. One of the youngest to clear the course. Uh, he looked he looked good. I know I know he's done well on A&W Jr. So I'm hoping that we'll get to see good things for him in Vegas. Uh, moving on. More fast forwards. Mike Salenzi cleared the course. Hunter Garrard cleared the course. Kyle Soderman cleared the course. Whole lot of course clearing. Getting fast forward. Uh, I'm happy for all of them for getting the ability to do that. And then they showed uh, Cal Ploros. Um, he had a, a, an amazing save on the Diamond Ash in which he he rushed, but then stopped from the battle roll. He kept running, but remembered he had to stop. And But then he leaned, because the rules, because a is very specific with their rules, but he leaned too forward with the momentum, his hands touched the diving dash, which means he had to go forward after that because he engaged with the obstacle. So then he had to essentially, from no running start, do the obstacle. He completed the obstacle. And that's the entire reason this run was shown, because he ended up uh, failing the crazy clocks, and he lost his grip on the obstacle. And it just wasn't far enough to move on. Uh, Ava Colasanti ended up failing the crazy clocks, but don't worry, we'll get to see her in Vegas. Uh, ben Martin had a uh, big save on Diamond Dash, struggling, you know, it was like doing this and stuff. You know, he, he was back. Good, good save. I like that save. But he ended up failing crazy clocks, so he's not moving on. And uh, then they showed Cam Baumgartner, who I didn't write how he did, but um, I'm going to assume he cleared. <laughs> Let me look real quickly. Did he clear? He did clear. Good. <laughs> and uh, at that point, he had the fastest time. So, uh, and, and Kyle Solderman had the second fastest time at that point of the episode. So you knew from the editing, hey, two people are going to beat their, going to beat their times. Speaking of, next up was Austin Gray. They, they showed him, uh, they started his run midway. Uh, at drop zone um his profile was about the kidney stuff again which is you know just a it's, a, it's fine as a recap but it's like if it, you know you know already if, if you're familiar with a and w you know about the whole uh donating kidney uh campaign of his um interesting thing when he made it to split zone he asked someone um on the sideline am i in vegas you know did he do well enough to go to vegas and um in because it probably influenced his decision of what to go for. And it turns out at that time, he wasn't safe yet. Um, probably because of number of people competing uh, and just so many people making it to Obstacle 9 already. So it's like, well, wasn't guaranteed right away. Uh, he ended up taking on the diving boards and clearing it. And he set the new fastest time at that point in time for clearing the whole course. Austin Gray is a good competitor who they uh, lately have only been showing when he makes it to a power tower. So um, if I was Austin, I'd hope that they have a power tower at the end of every obstacle course so he can get in the top two and that be, be forced to get featured. Um, and then in uh, another fast forward, Flip Rodriguez got fast forward shockingly and shockingly failed crazy clocks. He's not moving on to Vegas. This man used to, was was a safety pass winner in season eleven, and now he's not moving on. Shocking, and just devastating. Then they showed Joe Brown, who jumped Zuri Hall, had a big save on Diamond Dash, 
and failed crazy clocks. And that's really all that's worth saying. Uh, in more fast forwards, unfortunately, Kyle Schulze and Ethan Swanson both failed crazy clocks. They're not moving on. But Matt Bradley cleared the course, so he is moving on to Vegas. Then they showed Jake Murray. They featured his skateboarding pass. They started off on, uh, he started, they started his run on the barrel run. Uh, he was a little sloppy on drop zone, just having a hard time um, turning the handles 180. I was very surprised by that. And in, in many ways, the, the, uh, the commentators, Matt and Akbar, were concerned that, like, oh, is he going to, is he going to mess up? Because some, you know, Jake, Jake's a good competitor, but sometimes he gets, you know, he gets a little ahead of himself. But when he got to diving boards, he essentially skateboarded his way through the three, uh, which was awesome. His, his technique on the diving boards was great. Best technique. Basically, he went split-legged, like through the three, making sure each foot landed on each side of the spring. And uh, I don't know if it's possible to do the diving boards better than he did. Uh, and he ended up clearing the course with the fastest time of the night. I just want to point out that this is the fifth uh, course in a row that Jake Murray has gone the fastest time between last season and this season. That's now five courses in a row where Jake placed first. And it's entirely possible that Jake can get the fastest time in stage one, because he's done it twice in the past. So he might go six in a row. Jake Murray is definitely someone to look out for in Vegas. And I'll get, but I'll get more into that with my prediction special, which is coming soon. And then in some more fast forwards, my boy, Donovan Matoyer, Unfortunately, failed diving boards when he went for it, but he's moving on to Vegas, so hooray! Congratulations, Donovan. Super happy for you. Hopefully, they get to actually feature you this time around. And Taylor Amond failed uh, drop zone, but it was not good enough to move on. Um, also, because he wasn't mentioned here, I do want to give a slight shout-out to Jonah Munez, who is the other person to reach the split decision and not move on, becoming part of a very small club of people who have reached the ninth obstacle and failed to move on to Vegas. Uh, he failed the diving boards, for the record. And that left us with none other than Jessie Lebrecht for the final run. And she was uh, she powered through this course, but she ended up clearing the whole thing, getting her uh, third buzzer, her third uh, semifinal buzzer, I should say. I think it's like eight buzzers total she has. And uh, she was exhausted at the end. She looked like she was about to just collapse uh, from at the end. But, uh, I mean, Jessie is, is honestly like one of the best women um, in a and And she, you know, maybe this will be the year. I really hope this is the year that she finally clears stage one. Because, like, she deserves it. But she's got to earn it. That's the thing. You know, it was uh, the last USA versus the world. She was able to complete the course. But the thing is, you've got to clear the course within the time limit. So she's, she knows she can complete it, but she hasn't been able to clear it yet, you know? It's not just about beating all the obstacles. you got to do it in the time limit. So here's, here's to hoping she does it. And that brings us to the Power Tower. We had a little promo for Vegas for next week's episode. Um, not, not very spoilery, which I actually really appreciate. Um, I don't know what the uh, promo at the end of the episode looked like because I don't watch those promos anymore. <laughs> After what they did in, ep in Season 11. But the Power Tower was none other than Jake Murray and Austin Gray. This was a good race. This was one of those races where the lead kept subtly changing back and forth between the two. You know, there was parts where, where Austin had a slight lead and then Jake had a slight lead going through it. Uh, but the main difference was the falling shelves. Jake tried to do a sideways uh, transfer between the shelves to try to save time. And unfortunately, he fell on the course. He fell in the last obstacle. That gave Austin ample time to finish the course and earn that safety pass. So he becomes the fourth and final person to earn the ability to redo either stage one or stage two if he is to fail it. So overall, the power tower was good and it had some good moments. Uh, but as a whole, this episode was like not interesting to watch. And it had moments that like... 
it other than the the other than the stuff that I talked about at the very beginning of this review, there was nothing that really offended me. It just was presented in a really boring fashion. Uh, A&W needs to figure out its editing because it's killing the show, <laughs> at least creatively. Uh, and from an entertainment standpoint, it's killing the show. How do you make obstacle courses look boring? But A&W is finding a way to do that sometimes. But like I said, it had its moments. It had some, some good moments. It had some good ones that I liked. You know, Eric Milton was one of the, the highlights for me the entire episode. Jake Murray, I, I was just like watching him. And Jess Lebrecht, you know, those were just three highlights. But like most of the other stuff, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, it's it was fine. It wasn't offensive. It was just kind of like ho-hum. That's that's really the best way to say it, you know? Um, obviously, they, I don't, I don't, I doubt they were expecting 12 clears, you know, probably looked at the uh, results and was like, oops, but it is what it is. Let's look at those final results now, shall we? So in the end, no one failed the shrinking steps, no one failed the lunatic ledges, two people failed the barrel roll, two people failed diamond dash, eight failed drop zone, no one failed the warp wall or the sailing ladder, but nine people failed the crazy clocks, two failed the dungeon, and three failed the diamond board, no one failed the spider trap, and a whopping 12 people cleared the course, which is, in the modern a that's unheard of. But it happened. So here are your final group of competitors moving on to Las Vegas. So of the, so here are the 12 people who cleared the course. They are Jake Murray, Austin Gray, Cameron Baumgartner, Kyle Soderman, Kai Beckstrand, Hunter Gerard, Nate Hansen, Tyler Yamauchi, Matt Bradley, Eric Middleton, Mike Salenzi, and Jesse Labreck. And then the three people who failed either the dungeon or the diving boards were Devin Alexander, Donovan Matorier, and Jamie Ron. And your final two women moving on who um, who uh, are also moving on to Vegas was both Ava Colasanti and he- Heather Wesslinger, who uh, Heather failed the drop zone. And uh, AW Nation has Ava failing drop zone, but I could have sworn she failed crazy clocks based on my notes. Yeah, my notes... I don't seem to differentiate, but maybe uh, maybe she got DQ'd and uh, I wasn't aware of it. But or maybe I messed up in my notes. One of the two. But either way, Ava's moving on. That's that's the important thing to to note. And uh, so all in all, the show uh, it was fine. But like you know, we got out of the way. Next week, thank you. We are finally at Las Vegas. It's amazing. It's um, nine weeks. I mean, uh, 11, if you include the Olympics, <laughs> to lead up to just three weeks of a grand finale. It's, it's the longest buildup to, like, just the, the, a quick climax at the end. Hopefully, Vegas isn't a bust. <laughs> really, really hope that it's just... They go all out. I, I want there to be a winner this time around. Partially so we don't have to, like, recognize the most recent winner anymore. We don't have to say who the most last person to win a million dollars on the show was. But I'm excited. I want to see what the course is. And I I really hope that the final stage isn't just a rope climb. Boy, (laughs) it sure would be stupid if they did that again now, wouldn't it? Thank you all very much for watching. I will be doing a prediction special before stage one airs, so make sure you subscribe to know when that video goes live. And check out some of my past reviews of Ninja Warrior. Thank you all for watching. Goodbye.